It's a very small passage that we're going to go over tonight, but it's a huge concept uh, that we have to get as believers. And let's go ahead and read that. It's going to be beginning at verse 13, and we're going to read through the end of the chapter. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works and the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And as I was studying this passage this week, um, I kind of got excited because it reminded me my family really loves survival shows. Okay, we love like uh, Man vs. Wild or The Savage Line. Guys going out and women that are facing the wild frontier, they're thrown into the most harshest conditions and they're kind of like in this war zone battle with nature itself. And I was thinking about this as they have to rely on wisdom, knowledge that they've gained prior to going into this area. And what they choose to do and don't do can drastically change the outcome of the event. So if they choose to go down this path, it can lead to pain and hurt and sometimes even death if they get themselves into too dangerous of a situation. Or if they choose the right path, they're looking for how to secure uh, life and rescue from that situation. And there's really always those two paths that they have to choose. And if you think back, let's take a minute back and just think about the last four generations that we have in America. Um, I think we're producing the most intelligent and smarter generations that we've ever done before. And at least on paper, they can ace the school exams, they can take the test, and they can pass everything. But what happens when they get out in life now? They're failing at life. They're failing in the family, in the workplace. Things are going downhill because they have a head knowledge, but they don't have the wisdom, the ability to put what they've learned into practice. They're failing in life over it. Um, so I entitled it tonight, Pure Wisdom. And pure wisdom is an action that goes along with the head knowledge that Jesus is giving us through his word. And as I was thinking about this, um, let me break this down to a little bit more practical example, what I mean about people getting out in the world. Think about how many thousands of new drivers, you passed them all on the street getting in here tonight, get their licenses, they ace the test, they pass it. And what's the first thing they do? They usually end up, what, wrecking their car. But wait a minute, they passed the test. They had the head knowledge. They know what every sign means. They know what every red light means. They know the rules, what side of the road they're supposed to be on, on paper. But you put somebody new behind the wheel, and it's a totally different experience. What happens? It's real life. It's happening at fast pace. And head knowledge is good, but wisdom applies this action in everyday life and that what makes a good driver and thinking about this when I was driving in Europe and um, I remember the first time I got on their streets and for me it was everything in my natural instinct saying look you are on the wrong side of the road we should not be driving on the left and I would fight that but if I did what would happen my natural instincts would put me on the right side of the road, and what would I be? I'd be in danger, and I'd be putting everybody else around me in danger because I'm not adhering to what is the rules of the road. And I think that's what James is trying to say for these two Christians, or for Christians, there are two paths that we can pick. We can be in the left lane or the right lane, and one is based off heavenly wisdom. It's the right wisdom that we're supposed to follow, and this is the safe and secure place to be. Or we can get into the other lane, and we can follow earthly, or what he calls demonic wisdom, and it will end up in pain, hurt, or even death because we're on the wrong side of the road. And with a, like a skilled surgeon for these first three chapters and the words of a prosecuting attorney, James has been arguing about faith that it's not works that save us, but because we're saved, we should have an evidence of works to those around us to prove that we are saved. And we give a little bit of that definition that it means loving others. That's what biblical works means, what the definition that Jesus gave. But the added benefit for us for doing works, James said a beautiful uh, outline in that first chapter was we get the added benefit that when we follow God and we follow his precepts, we follow everything, we get this the richest and fullest life. 
And I'm talking about money or wealth. We get to experience life actually with joy, whether we have nothing or we have a lot. We have joy in our life because we're following what God has said. Whether it's good times or bad, is what he said in the first chapter, we get to experience joy because we are on the right path. Um, so up to this point, James has kind of argued um, that this path is, we do this because why? We serve a good father. We can trust him with it. So he puts this first question on the table back in verse 13. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct? Let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So in James's day, he's facing the same thing. He sent this letter out to all the Christians who got scattered uh, from Acts when there was a big persecution. Stephen got martyred and the persecution got so heavy by the, uh, Saul before he became Paul that they scattered abroad. And now he's hearing wind that there's these teachers saying, look, we're wise, we're smart, we know all these things. Sounds a lot like today. There's people who believe they're wise, they have a head knowledge, and they think that makes them wise. But, Paul, but James is going to argue that it actually does not make them wise. Um, last week, he actually started talking and coming against those that were teachers or believers in the church by them using their tongues like an out-of-control fire. They were consuming everything like a blaze going through a forest, everything around them. And he's saying this ought not be. So those kind of out-of-control tongues in this context of this chapter, now he's coming in and saying, look, it's time to start driving the car because you've aced the exam. You're now talking the talk, but will you walk it? Will you actually put what you're saying into action every single day? So he's saying, if you think you're wise, then drive the car on the right side of the road. Um, and he's really challenging. What's he ask him? He says, if you're wise, then show me. Show me a life of fruit in the Lord, of loving others. Put it to action. In verse 13, he gives the first characteristic of godly wisdom, and he calls it meekness. And in today's, especially with men, we like to be macho. And it, oftentimes, meekness will get confused or even be accused of being weak. They'll say, you're weak if you're meek. You should stand up for yourself. You should speak your mind. You should never let anybody run over you. Well, the ultimate example of meekness in every scripture points to Jesus. It was Jesus. It was in his life. He was the ultimate example of meekness. And let me be very clear about something. Jesus was not, he is not, and he never will be weak. What do I mean by that? Yes, he came as a baby. He was born in a manger. He was silent as his persecutors drove him to the cross. He didn't do anything when they spit in his face. When they executed him, he was meek about it, like, a, like they called him a lamb to the slaughter. That's as meek as you can get. But what we don't understand is it took the strength of God himself to accomplish what Jesus did on the cross that day. Think about it. We learned last week that it takes Jesus. We cannot even tame our own tongue. We don't have the strength to do that. It takes Jesus to do that. It was a supernatural strength that helped Jesus to be meek when he walked here in our presence. And often we forget the words that Jesus said to his disciples when they were in the garden and they were worried about, is this all over? Wait a minute, Jesus is being arrested. He's not, why isn't he delivering us right now? Why isn't he doing this? And he calls this to remembrance in Matthew 26, 53. He says, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Now, in the Old Testament, God sent one angel to deliver one of the Old Testament prophets, and he wiped out 180,000 people in one night. Twelve legions of angels would have been about 72,000 angels if it went by Roman centurion standards. Imagine what he could do. He's king of kings, lord of lords. He has a name above all names, and he could have destroyed the universe a million times over. But think about the strength that it took for him to hold that strength back as they pierced his hands with nails. And he didn't react. Think about how he restrained his own power when they pierced him in the side. They would have lost me at being spit in the face. I would not have had that. This is a supernatural power. Jesus embodied wisdom 
And it was accompanied by meekness. It was the ultimate power under control. He had his power under control. Only through him can we live a meek life, is what James has been saying. So this is how the Bible actually describes wisdom. So the characteristic that should accompany it is meekness, but this is wisdom itself. It says in Proverbs 9.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And that word fear just means reverence. We are to acknowledge that God is who He says He is. He's God. He's the creator of the universe, and we're acknowledging him, him for that, and that He is the only God in our life. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, and it's really difficult because we are, we are hot-wired by sin itself to think opposite. But truly, the universe revolves around him and not us. Think about that for a second. That's a hard pill to swallow for us tonight. That The universe revolves around him and not us. That goes against everything that we're being taught outside the church walls or outside of Scripture. So what was Jesus' driving force to be meek when the nails were being pierced into his hands or the, um, the spear into his side? What was keeping him that meek lamb that held his tongue quiet? And the only thing he said was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Jesus says it himself in John 6, 38. He says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He could live meekly because it was more important to him to please God the Father with his life, his mind, his actions. Everything revolved around God's will. And God said, I have to have you go to the cross because I love them. And Jesus said, I will do it willingly. So the first characteristic is meekness, but the first step to wisdom is placing ourselves under the mighty hand of God and realizing who he is and that everything in this world is created for him and by him. And I think when I thought about this, when I was first trying to give my heart and mind over to him uh, at, an, at an early age, I used to think, man, is he taking something from me? Is he stealing some part of my life? And that's not what he's doing. He's saying, will you entrust me with what you hold most dear? Will you, will you give me what you treasure? Will you let me hold it in my hands, put it in my plan, and take care of it? And not only will I take care of it, but I will have it more abundantly given back to you. Not, not money and finances. I'm talking about life. So you can enjoy the people around you. So you can experience God's restoration power in your family, in your friends, at your workplace. Everywhere you go, you can experience God's glory and experience joy overall. And it all happens when we submit to his will. And when we do that, it results in meekness because we realize he's God, I'm not. My favorite part of those survival stories, though, I love it when they get in those situations and uh, to really get ratings on TV, they really have to put themselves in actual danger for a minute. Uh, there's nothing better. My kids laugh at it when Bear Grylls strips all the way down. He jumps into the icy water in the middle of the Antarctic, and he has to pull himself back out and go get a fire. And my son, Nathaniel, goes, why would he do that? And I said, ratings. It's just higher ratings. But what he's doing is he's actually showing this is what your body will do if you get into danger. It'll go into hypothermia. And if you don't get heat, if you don't get warm back up, if you don't get dry and your, your clothes dry, you will die. This is the path that if you go this direction instead of where I'm telling you to go and be safe, this is what will happen. It'll cause pain and hurt. And that's what um, James is going to do in the next little bit here in verses 14 is he's going to show us that what happens when we go down the wrong path. So let's pick it up in verse 14 and verse 15. It says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And it just means if we're living a life of jealousy and selfish ambition, which it doesn't take very long to realize that we are all wired that way. We all struggle with that. It doesn't matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, you will... It's a constant struggle to overcome that. When you walk into the house and you're saying, uh, walk in from work, where's my dinner? Hey, why isn't my clothes washed? Or kids, why aren't your rooms picked up? Why haven't you done this, this, and this? And our thinking is all about why haven't you done this for who? For me. 
And what's it cause? It causes problems. Why? Because we're in it for ourselves instead of what God's calling us to do. And But why is it demonic? Why does he call it this? And what happens is when we act this way, when we're selfish, what's it doing? We are putting ourselves in place of who? God. It's all about me. And what does that boil down to? Idol worship. We have placed something else that's more important above God, and it's ourselves. And I was thinking about this. This is, this is the same type of thinking that got us in trouble in the garden with Adam and Eve. Eve was tempted to be jealous and selfish, and she went for it. In Genesis 3, it talks about how that happened, that she really wanted to be like God and wanted the universe to really revolve around her. Genesis 3 says, The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. He knew where to hit her. Knowing good and evil, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to, her, to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise... She took of its fruits and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So this isn't about a behavior issue. This is a, she was following all the codes and what God has set up to that point. She was doing, just like people do church today. Hey, I go to church, I go to Sunday school, I, I read my Bible, I'm in a small group, I'm taking notes, and all these things. But that's not what God's asking for. God's asking, let me have your heart. And it was a heart issue for her. Deep down, she wanted to be God. She did not want to serve him. It was a heart issue. She did not love him with all her heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's where the deceit came in, that she desired something else above him. That's the reason that selfish ambition really comes from the enemy's handbook. Isaiah uh, talks about this, that he's the, kind of the father of jealousy and selfish ambition and the ultimate lie that we are God and God Jehovah is not. Isaiah talks about this as God is talking to our enemy. It says, How you are fallen from heaven. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. That is how the enemy thinks. So when James is calling us, it might sound harsh and kind of overly dramatic. But if we put it in context of where it's really coming from, we understand where the selfish ambition and desire is coming. And if we understand what James is saying, he's prescribed, look, this is not the right path. If we look at the enemy, what happened to him? He got cast to earth like lightning. And what's his ultimate outcome? He's going to spend eternity into where? The lake of fire. Now think of practically just Eve and Adam, what they had to do. They took the fruit. What was the outcome? They had to experience life, a harsh life. They had it good, but they had experienced harshness. They had experienced pain, needless death in their lives. Why? Because they chose a different path than what God had set up perfectly for them, saying, if you go this direction, you will be with me, and you will experience life above and beyond. But if you go this direction, all you're going to end up is folly. But they chose the wrong path. Their own desire was overruling God's. In verse 16, he says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every evil practice. So Adam and Eve, they lost, their, they lost the perfection of Eden. They lost all of that for the hardship of this world. And as I was thinking this, I used to manage two uh, large Fortune 500 companies. And when you're in the management that high, there are people who are, are I would say, at least 70% of the people that are in the higher up category are driven by jealousy and selfish ambition. They are looking to do anything, uh, step on anyone, take advantage of anything to do one thing, to get gain in their own life. They will cut throat. They will do whatever it takes. And really, they are, most of them are actually smarter than everybody else. They have all the smarts. But because they're driven by this, they are, they are living a train-wrecked life. And usually what they end up doing is train-wrecking other people's lives. They fire people for no reason. Um, they step on people. They make them work long hours. They break up families. All because of what? Their selfish ambition is driving them. And it's a train wreck. It's complete disorder because their priorities are out of whack. 
And James is advocating, don't take that path. It doesn't lead to life. Just like the survival shows, do not go down this road because ultimately it will lead to death. And we have no problem seeing Bear Grylls jump in the water and we say, we're never going to do that. But James is saying, don't go down this path and we have to think about it twice. Is he really telling the truth? And the problem really is both paths look so close to each other, yet they're so far away. And I was thinking about this encounter that Jesus and Peter had for an example of this. Um, at one point, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Messiah. You're, you're the one we've been waiting for. And how does Jesus respond to that? Only God the Father could have given you that knowledge. That's where it came from. It was heavenly wisdom. And then only a few sentences later, what happens? Jesus says, I have to go to the cross and I'm going to die. And what's Peter say? No, you're not. And what's Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. That little bit, all it took... That wasn't even a huge statement. I, I guess Peter probably had the right heart. I don't want to see you die, Jesus. I don't want to see you go through that. But what was it doing? His will was trumping the will of Jesus. And what did Jesus call it? Get behind me, Satan. Same thing that his little brother, his half-brother here, James, is teaching us, is this is a demonic thought. It's a big word, it's a scary word, but this is simply the behavior that we have to watch out for, and this is where it's coming from. Colossians 1.16, I've already quoted this, says, All things were created through him and for him. And in order to walk in pure wisdom, we have to do it humbly and meekly, and we bow at the feet of Jesus as his creation. Do we understand that? We are created for him and by him. And if Jesus is our creator, he knows what we're created to do better than we do. And we have to put his ways above our ways. Um, to complete this chapter, um, remember we opened last week with he's talking about how to use a tongue and he's saying, show me your wisdom by your actions. And if I were to sum it up, I would say, just don't just hear it, don't just think it, don't just say it, but live out your faith through pure wisdom. So he finishes the chapter by describing the fruit of heavenly wisdom in verse 17. He says, but the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Each fruit that was talked about here represents who? Jesus' ministry here on earth. All those things, there's nobody that I can think of that really encompasses all of those things. But he's saying, if we walk in his wisdom, this is the fruit in our lives that through giving our ears, our thoughts, our tongue, all these things over to him, we are sowing into kingdom work. That is the result of it. And he said we are fulfilling then what we are created to do. Who would look at verses 17 and 18 and say, I wouldn't want a peaceable life with everybody that I walk into. I wouldn't want to see righteousness in everybody's life that I walk into. And it starts in our own. We have to be willing to submit and call him Lord and Savior and say, look, God, I know the path I was going. I know I got distracted by things and I, I veered off, but help me guide me back to here. And if we accept the fact that it's all about God, it makes it so much easier and understand that we have the benefit, not the right, we have the benefit of life being full of joy because he loves us. That's why. But if we make it all about ourselves, we just live selfishly and we treat everybody selfishly and things are going to go in disarray. But if we live that life, it's all about God and we're victorious in our actions. And I was thinking about it, it all depends upon how we read and interpret this. If we put the wrong emphasis on this book in different areas, we can get it all wrong. How many of you are familiar with Psalms 23? Everybody's heard that one. Okay, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. All these things. If you read that thinking and just 
that's the only passage you would read, you would automatically think, man, this is good. This is all, man, he's, he's leading me in these great lush green fields. He's, he's taking me by still waters. He's giving me life. He's giving me victory over my enemies. And our mentality right there starts to do what? It's all about me. But how does David end Psalm 23? He did all of this for his name's sake. He did all of it for him. It's about him. We just get the added benefit of his love through life. And he's saying, I don't, I don't want to take anything from you, but because I love you, will you trust me with your life? Will you trust me with your actions? Will you trust me with everything? And watch how more of a full life I can give you in Christ. That's how Jesus did it, and that's how we can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit today is we live for him as God. And, as, and the Bible talks about uh, Paul called it, we need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That every thought that comes in, we have to hold it up to the word and say, look, is this really being driven by a Christ-like heart or is this driven by something else? He also says, through the Holy Spirit, we cast down everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. That's what we're doing. But he says we have the ability to do that through the Holy Spirit, that there's only one God to be glorified. Amen? Amen. So wisdom starts at a place where we can get really serious. As I was thinking about this, when did, when did my life really start changing for the Lord? And yeah, I got saved at age 17, but when, when, did, when did wisdom kick in? When did it leave from just a head knowledge and start just really kicking into my life? And it was at the point where that first characteristic, when we acknowledge him, when we fear him, when we reverence him, it kicks in as humbleness and meekness at the feet of Jesus. We realize, we really realize our need for him, that everything else, every tendency I have is to drive the wrong way, even though in Europe I know I'm supposed to be on the left side. But everything drives me to the right because I'm American. That same thing with sin. We are sinful in our nature. And it has the tendency of driving us that way. And James is saying, look, I want you to see it so that you don't go down that path. You go down this one. And what we do next is when we become humble and meek at his feet, we confess those sins. Lord, I know I've done this. I've hurt people with my selfish ambition, with my jealousy. I've hurt my family, my friends, co-workers, everyone around me. We confess it to him and we repent of that jealousy, of that pride that we have. Acknowledging our desperate need for him. That's where it starts at. But as we look at this, we, it's, simply, it's easy to say, look, we know we need to walk in wisdom. We know we need that. But how do we practically engage it? How do we grow in wisdom? Because if we need it, if the Holy Spirit's going to use it, how do we grow in that wisdom? I'm going to give you three things. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says, All Scripture is, is breathed out by God and profitable, valuable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What are we talking about in James? Works. And what are works? Loving others. It's saying that we have to be in this. If we want to grow in wisdom, we have to grow in the understanding of God of the Bible. Not the God of our heart, not the God of everything else that we rely on, but the God of the Bible. That's where it starts is in here. And what's it good for? It equips us for every good work. It, it equips us for every time that God calls us to love our wife, our husband, our kids, our neighbor. He says, I will fully equip you to do it, but it starts here. And the biggest thing is, do we submit to God's word as authority and we take it for what it says? Or are we the ones saying, look, I'm the authority. That's a good scripture, but it doesn't really apply to me. If we live that, we will not reap its full equipping. Another way, besides just getting into the word, Proverbs says eleven fourteen, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. Now, earthly wisdom, when we're hurt or we're going through things, a lot of times, and I, I've experienced this in my own life, um, it, we will hear the lie, it's better to be isolated and alone than to be hurt again by people. It's better to be that way than to go out and get 
injured by somebody else. It's risky to love others. But God is saying, look, we need to be in fellowship or in a community of believers, and that will help us grow. There's safety in that. And I've, I've, yes, I've felt the bumps and the bruises of loving people and going through life with others, and it hurts. But I can stand up here many years later and say, all those instances, every time I was hurt, God used those to grow me and mature me. And the way that he uses my family to love others now blows my mind. Because I see people outside the church that don't have Jesus. They go through the same things and they are crippled and isolated in depression. And it's not by anything I did. He used it. He grew me. But we're called to fellowship, not be isolated. Be in the body. The third way would be is to, that we would grow. Hebrews 13, 17 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as, though, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So we're to submit to leadership. What is, why is that important? It's an evidence that our heart is submitted to the Lord if we follow leaders. And not just specific, specifically me. There are times um, that leadership, even myself, will fall, will fail. But we have to trust God that he's leading them. Even as a lead pastor, I still have people that I put in leadership that hold me accountable willingly. I submit to them. I bring them in for counsel, and I will ask them questions. How can I grow in this area? Did I do anything wrong in this area? Or how can I, how can I overcome this obstacle in my life? I willingly do that. Why? Because it says in the scripture, it's advantage to you. I will grow you, I will mature you, like James chapter 1 says, into the image of who? Jesus. That's his goal. And he says, if you'll submit, not if it's a good leader or bad leader, if you will submit, I will be faithful to grow you. Now, we do want to put ourselves under good leadership. And the way I pick that in my life is I want to go underneath somebody's leadership or somebody's accountability that their only goal in life is nothing about selfish ambition. They are constantly pointing me to Jesus. That's how you know it's a good leader. And that's why we preach the word at Calvary. We go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. It's so that you will understand. And that's why I ask, you have a Bible in your hand. If not, grab one. I want you guys to see that this is not about me preaching my agenda. There's nothing in here that benefits me except spiritually in my own walk for me to proclaim the truth to you. That's the love of Christ coming out saying, this is about Jesus. The only thing I want to benefit is the kingdom. I want souls to meet Jesus Christ because he's changed my life. I want them to experience that. I don't want them to have to experience the hurt and the pain that I used to when I was not walking down that path. And no, I'm not perfect yet. That's what James said. We're being sanctified. It's not about perfection. It's about progress that we are constantly checking. Are we walking down the right path or are we not? James is not a book about judging others. It's about an internal question. That's why we always ask them things like, do you think you're wise? Then this is what it should look like. If not, correct it. And I was thinking about just the added benefit. What does it mean? God himself is reaching out through the word, through the Holy Spirit, through believers, through the community and the body of the fellowship, through leadership, everything that he has set up to do one thing, and that's to have relationship with you and with me. He's reaching out to us. And think about what he's offering, that through the relationship with the good Father, God the Father, that he has bought for us through Jesus and has empowered us through the Holy Spirit to have access to the same wisdom that created the universe, that created you and I for a specific task. It's kind of like having the owner's manual for a car. And we're saying, wow, all the information's in here. But it goes past that. Will we take the owner's manual? We'll learn everything we can about the car, and then when we get in it, start the key and actually use it. Will we drive it? That's what James is declaring. Drive the car tonight. And that we can rest in that wisdom. Why? We don't have to have selfish ambition. We don't need that anymore because we realize that there's nothing more to get, that there's nothing more to gain than Jesus. That's why he did the Colossian study. He's preeminent. He's above everything. 
He's it. Let's pray.